Over the next six weeks or so, we are going to see the power of God displayed in man in this new series. Oftentimes, you'll notice a familiar observation, which is this. God often displays His power amidst difficult and trying circumstances in a way that will bring Himself glory. Oftentimes, God displays His power amidst difficult situations, amidst trials, for one reason, to bring Himself glory. Well, if you would, take your Bibles and turn to Judges chapter 13. In the first third of your books, the Bible, Joshua, Judges, chapter 13. It's kind of a little bit hilarious this morning. I was kind of had the TV on as I was kind of getting dressed this morning. And there was another TV uh, pastor on. And as, uh, as he was going through, he told everybody in the congregation to turn over to a certain passage. And as they were turning, and there was just that moment of awkward that all preachers have been through at some point, and probably will go through again at some point. That look of, wait a minute, that's not what I studied, and that's not where I'm supposed to be telling everyone to go. And then the next thing you know, he puts his head back up and goes, and when you get there, turn three more chapters to the right where I am supposed to be. <laughs> so uh, I've been through that a couple of times, and uh, I think all of us as pastors, it's like, wait a minute, I just told everybody to turn to this passage, and that's not what I wanted to bring. That has nothing to do with what I'm saying. <laughs> oh, well. Judges chapter 13 is where we're going to be for a little while this morning. If you would, let's just pray and ask the Lord's blessing on the message this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for allowing us, as we prayed earlier, Lord, the freedom to worship you through the word, not just with music, Lord, but through the word. And I pray, God, that our hearts might be right before you. And Lord, I'm convinced, as John MacArthur made comment on years ago, is that one of the most dangerous things that we can do as believers is get to a passage and, oh, I've heard something on that before, and kind of tune out. I pray, God, that we would not do that today. But, God, that we would honestly ask for you to work in our hearts and our lives, Lord, to draw us closer to you, to learn what you'd have for us to learn, that we may apply it to our hearts and our lives. So, Lord, that's what I ask this morning. I ask that you would just help us to learn what you'd have for us to learn, that we may apply it to our lives, that we may draw closer to you and see your hand at work. And we'll praise you for it, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, consider a man named Samson, um, born in a period of history whereby the Israelites were doing evil in the sight of God. And so God, as always, has a plan. And oftentimes, even though we may not see his plan fully enacted, we know that he's always behind the scenes working. And we see right away in Judges chapter 13, verse 1, it says the Israelites again did what was evil in the, in the Lord's sight. So the Lord handed them over to the Philistines 40 years. And so this time frame in which Samson is coming on the scene is not a very pleasant one. It's a time frame when there was evil almost continuously. And we, it's amazing, as we mentioned that this morning in Sunday school, is that there are several places throughout the Scriptures where it says that man was doing evil in the sight of the Lord. And this was no different. This time period that God had been basically set aside, we want a man to lead us, and God said, hey, we're, we're going to bring judges on the scene to take care of things. And so, as we consider Samson... He is born in a period where the Israelites were doing evil in the sight of the Lord. However, God has a reason behind everything He does, and He's going to use Sam, Samson to save His people. And we see that um, in verses 2 and following. He says, There was a certain man from Zorah, from the family of Dan, whose name was Manoah. His wife was unable to conceive and had no children. The angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, it is true that you are unable to conceive and have no children, but you will conceive and give birth to a son. Now this is an interesting thing here to consider in verses 4 and following. It says, Now please be careful not to drink wine or beer or to eat anything unclean. For indeed you will conceive and give birth to a son. You must never cut his hair because the boy will be a Nazarite to God from birth. And here's the purpose. And he will begin to save Israel from the power of the Philistines. Isn't it amazing to say, well, why would God bring somebody on the scene to save somebody which He put them under? That almost doesn't make sense, does it? 
But it does if you're God, because sometimes we have a lesson to learn. And sometimes we're reminded of the very fact that when we have, make a choice, every choice has consequences. And so the consequence of Israel living in sin and doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord was God, God said, listen, you're going you're gonna to act that way? You want to make these kinds of choices? Okay, suffer the consequence of those choices, which is you're going to be under the hand and under the thumb of the Philistines. And so even though God put them under them, God says they're going to learn a lesson and then I'm going to bring them out from it. It's amazing that he is going to use Samson to accomplish his will. But Samson was going to be a Nazarite. So he says, I'm going to bless Manoah and his wife while I'm at it. Isn't it amazing that even amidst the difficulties, God brings those blessings into our lives that only he can bring? I mean, here's Manoah and his wife. They're unable to have children. And so as God has done several times throughout Scripture, he blesses those who are unable to conceive, and then he brings something miraculous, something that only he can do from that woman. And so he brings up about her the ability to bear a child named Samson who would deliver the Israelites. And he'll be a Nazarite. And Manoah did just as the angel suggested. And then he offered a sacrifice. We see in verses 19 through 21. Down in verse 19 says, Manoah took a young goat and a grain offering and offered them to the rock of the Lord who did something miraculous <coughs> while Manoah and his wife were watching. So here he is. He's willing to bring an offering and the angel says, no, I don't want that. The messenger says, I don't want that. But you should do it for the Lord. And so he begins to worship uh, as God blesses him. And you know, worship was partly a response to what God was doing. And it kind of, as I was reading through this passage over the last two weeks, the thought came to my mind, how often do we worship God? First of all, how often do we worship God? And then how often do we worship God daily because of what he's done for us? I mean, it's easy to say, well, here's a big thing that God did. I'm going to praise him for it. What about the day in and the day out? And we think of worship in terms of music or singing or instrumentation. But do we worship God with our lives? Remember what it tells us in Romans chapter 12? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you what? Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable what? Service. And in some of your translations, it's translated worship. In light of what God has done for you, are you willing to worship Him in return? Give your life in service to Him in return for what He's done for you. And we see this is exactly what Manoah and his wife did. In light of what God had just done, them, done for them, he turned around and sacrificed and worshipped God. What a reminder that we should be worshipping God for everything that He does for us. Worship is not a daily event that happens every Sunday, right? Right? I mean, we know that up here, but do we know that in our heart? Do we know that it's not just Sundays that we come to worship? It should be a daily thing. And so he's beginning to learn this as God is working. And it's amazing here as you go on, verse 21, it says, The angel of the Lord did not appear again to Manoah and his wife. Then Manoah realized that it was the angel of the Lord. And verse 22, we're certainly going to die, he said to his wife, because we have seen God. I mean, they looked at us, what God has done. We had actually seen God. And his wife reminds him, as our wives do so often, men, no, you're not going to die. If God wants you to die dead, you'd be dead already. And uh, it's just how it works. And verse 24, so the woman gave birth to a son and named him Samson. And the boy grew, and here's the phrase, the Lord blessed him. The Lord blessed him. And as we see this thing, and what I want us to see over the next several weeks is that God works powerfully in and through man. But it's not the man who does it. We could look at all the events of Samson's life, and I have no doubt as we were to go around the auditorium this morning, we'd have all heard stories about Samson, who he is, what he's done, the incredible strength that he has, the things that he's noted for. But sometimes if we're not careful, we get the idea that it was Samson who did it? It wasn't Samson. It was God working through Samson, right? We all know that, right? There we go. So it's not Samson. It wasn't that he was just a behemoth of a man, although he could have been. It was God working through him to accomplish his will. Because remember, it was never about Samson. It was about God using a man, displaying his power through man, that he might free the children of Israel. So the bottom line is, God's hand was upon him. And the boy grew, and the Lord blessed, and then the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him 
in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtel. So here's what happens. Samson begins to grow into a strong young man. And God's hand is upon him. The Spirit's working through him. And really what God had called him, what God had bore him for, the purpose for which he was alive, is going to now start to come to fruition. And we see it in verse 14 as we read through this story a little bit. So follow along as I begin reading in chapter 14, verse 1. So Samson went down to Timnah and saw a young Philistine woman there. And he went back and told his father and his mother, I have seen a young Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as a wife. Wow, a little, a little bit bossy, isn't he? I mean, get her for me. I've seen her. I want her. Make it happen, Dad. By the way, my kids, don't ever tell me to do that because you may not like what I choose. So far, you're doing pretty really good, though. Um, but his father and mother said to him, Can't you find a young woman among your relatives or among any of our people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines for a wife? Now think about this just for a moment. Is this a little bit of an oxymoron here? I mean, they're under the hand, under the oppression of who? The Philistines. And where does Sam, Samson want to find a wife amongst? The Philistines. Who God has set him to free from the Philistines. And mom and dad are like, I don't know about this, Samson. Are you sure there's not anyone else you can find? I mean, isn't there anybody around here that you could like hook up with? But no, no, I want this woman. I say, wow, um, that's a little bit crazy. His actions are a little bit crazy as he's going down to Timnah. But he ignored his parents' warnings. But even though he ignored his parents' warnings, God was working behind the scenes. Remember this? Back to, back to chapter 13, verse 1. Look at look verse 4. Now his father and mother did not know this was from the... Whoa! So is it possible that Samson's desires were created by the Lord? Now, does God work the way we work? <laughs> nope. Just kind of give you that heads up. God sometimes works exact opposite of how we would work, Right? Because if we're up to us, we do a whole lot of things a whole lot differently, right? But God is working through Samson to free the Israelites. So it's almost like God has this plan. He's going to just kind of implant Samson in the midst of it all. And his father and mother did not know that this was from the Lord, who wanted the Philistines to provide an opportunity for confrontation. You see, God was working behind the scenes. I don't want to get Samson in there. He's going to create a scene that we can work through. So at that time, the Philistines were ruling Israel. So verse 5, Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came to the vineyards of Timnah. And suddenly a young lion came roaring at him. And you're going to find out three times in the next couple chapters, three times this phrase comes out. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. Three times the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. The first time, so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. Think about that. But I want you to remember something. I don't believe it is because Samson was just so strong that he could just do whatever with his big muscles. I believe that God's hand was on him. That the Spirit of the Lord was working through him. It was God's power on display through Samson, right? So, but he did not tell his father or mother what he had done. Then he went on and spoke to the woman because she seemed right to Samson. And isn't it amazing how what we do, our actions follow what we think? So God's word says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So our thoughts become, what's the word? Actions and who we are. So we have to be careful to guard our thoughts, which will in turn help us control our actions. So Samson was doing what he was doing, even though God was working behind the scenes, because it was what seemed right to him. As we see there in verse 7. So after some time, when he returned to marry her, he left the road to see the lion's carcass, and there was a swarm of bees with honey in the carcass. 
This is the lion that he just killed. It had been sitting there. We don't know how long he was gone, but he was gone long enough for the bees to have found it and, and to, to have built a nest into the, the carcass of the lion. So he scooped some honey into his hands and ate it as he went along. And when he came to his father and mother, he gave some to them and they ate it. I'm thinking to myself, this must have been a monster amount of bees. If he's eaten enough that he's eaten along the way, and he goes and brings some back to his parents, must have been a monster amount of bees. And maybe he was gone for longer than we think. But verse 10, his father went to visit the woman, and Samson prepared a feast there. As young women were accustomed to do, when the Philistines saw him, they brought 30 men to accompany him. And this is where Samson's starting to play with the folks around him and not really taking serious. Maybe he didn't really realize at first the seriousness of what his calling was as a Nazarite and what God was going to do through him. And he says, oh, I'll play a little game with these people. These people are around the, the woman that I love. They're Philistines. Let's play a little game with them. Let me tell you a riddle, he says, verse 12. Samson said to them, If you can explain it to me during the seven days of the feast and figure it out, I'll give you 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. But if you can't explain it to me, you must give me 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. Tell us your riddle, they replied. Let's hear it. So here's the riddle. So he said to them, Out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. I mean, just think about it for a moment. I mean, who of us would have a clue? But they were game. They wanted to try it. They took on the challenge. Out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. So after three days, they were unable to explain the riddle. And on the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, Persuade your husband to explain the riddle to us, or we will burn you and your father's family to death. Did you invite us here to rob us? I mean not like having any pressure or anything. You better figure it out or we're going to kill you. Not real good situation here. So Samson's wife came to him weeping and said, you hate me and don't love me. You told my people the riddle, but haven't explained it to me. Here comes the old uh, guilt trip. Here comes the old wife manipulation. You're going to do what we want you to do. So Samson's wife came to him weeping and said, you hate me. In verse uh, down in the middle of the verse, look, he said, I haven't even explained it to my father or mother, so why would I explain it to you? Sounds valid enough, right? I mean, it's my secret. I don't have to tell you. I didn't tell anyone else. I'm not going to tell you either. She wept the whole seven days of the feast, and at last, on the seventh day, he explained it to her. I guess the, the crying got it. it was the tears. Can take the yelling, but I can't take the tears. Just kidding. Then she explained it to her people. On the seventh day before the sunset, the men of the city said to him, What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? Now guys, just let me give you a piece of advice here. How Samson responded to his wife is not how you should probably respond. Now don't read ahead. Hold on. Just kind of look right here just for a second. This week on Facebook, I think Jane, you, met, you liked it. You saw it. Maybe it was you. I think it was. A little elementary child said, how would you explain marriage? Or how would you think marriage would be, you know, how would a husband get, and a wife get along together in marriage? And the response was, tell her she's really pretty, even though she may look like a dump truck. <laughs> pretty sure that won't go over real well if you tell her she looks like a dump truck. But here's what Samson says to the men who explain the riddle. If you hadn't plowed with my young cow, you wouldn't know my riddle now. Guys, just don't call your wife a cow in any way, shape, or form. It just is never going to get you ahead in life, right? If you hadn't plowed with my young cow, he's calling his wife a young cow. Yeah, don't do that. Verse 19. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully on him. This is the second time that the Spirit of the Lord is coming on him in a powerful way. It says, And he went down to Ashkelon and killed 30 of their men. Remember, here's the deal. If you can tell me, he didn't say, you know, there were no stipulations on how they had to come up with the answer. Threatening the wife, she's probably going to figure out what she can do to get the answer. 
But the bottom line is, they gave him the answer, and he had to come up with 30 garments. So he goes down to Ashkelon and kills 30 of their men, stripped them, and gave their clothes to those who explained the riddle. In rage, Samson returned to his father's house, and his wife was given to one of the men who had accompanied him. Now, wait a minute. Maybe she got word that she, called, she was called a young cow. I don't know. But next thing you know, she's married now to someone else. Dad gave her away to someone else. And then he kind of justifies it a little bit. Chapter 15. Later on, during the wheat harvest, Samson took a young goat as a gift and visited his wife, who's now with someone else. I wanted to go to my wife in her room, and he said, but her father would not let him enter. I was sure you hated her, her father said. He made an assumption that because she gave it up, that maybe Samson didn't love her anymore. So he gave her to someone else. So I gave her to one of the men who accompanied you. Isn't her younger sister more beautiful than she is? Why not take her instead? Well, there's kind of only one problem with that. I ain't married to her, I'm married to her. A little situation going on here. So verse 3. Samson said to them, This time I will be blameless when I harm the Philistines. Now, now think about this. Why was Samson on the scene to take control of the Philistines? God was working behind the scenes. And everything he does is just irritating the Philistines even more. Gets in there, gets in the family, so to speak. He's causing a ruckus. He's killing men. They're upset. It just is escalating. So what does Samson do? Verse 4, chapter 15. So he went out and caught 300 foxes. How do you do that? How do you catch 300 foxes? I mean, he just went out and caught 300 foxes. No big deal. It's another day's work, right? How do you do that? Don't know. But he took torches, turned the foxes tail to tail, and put a torch between each pair of tails, and then he ignited the torches and released the foxes into the standing grain of the Philistines. He burned the piles of grain and the standing grain as well as the vineyards and the olive groves. I mean, these 300 foxes go out and they just burn everything. Tells you maybe it's towards the harvest time as things are drying out. And these foxes just burn through everywhere they go, everywhere they run. Their tails are lighting everything on fire. And the Philistines are really excited. Not. Verse 6. The Philistines asked... Who did this? And they were told it was Samson, the Timnite's son-in-law, because he took Samson's wife and gave her to his companion. So he's just a little upset that father-in-law gave his wife away. So he's going to take matters in his own hands. So the Philistines went to her and her father and burned them to death. So Philistines aren't real happy at the moment. Their crops are gone. Vineyards are gone. Olives are gone. Their livelihood taken from them. Coincidence? No. God said he was going to subdue them. God said he was going to destroy the Philistines. Probably not how you and I would do it. I mean, I would have never thought of using a fox with a torch. I mean, but God works differently than you and I. But nonetheless, they're upset and they burn the family. Verse 7, then Samson told them, because you did this, I swear that I won't rest until I've taken vengeance on you. He tore them limb from limb and then went down and stayed in a cave at the rock of Edom. And the Philistines went up, camped in Judah, and raided Lehi. And so the men of Judah said, Why have you attacked us? And they replied, We have come to tie Samson up and pay him back for what he did to us. So everybody's upset with Samson now. It's like he has no friends left. Family's gone. Philistines are after him. They're waiting outside the cave, just waiting for him to come out so they can attack him. They're upset. In verse 11, check this out. 3,000 men of Judah went to the cave at the rock of Edom, and they asked Samson, Don't you realize that the Philistines rule us? What have you done to us? This guy's got nowhere to turn. Philistines are mad. They're all mad at him. I have done to them what they did to me, he answered. They said to him, we've come to tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. Then Samson told them, swear to me that you, you yourselves won't kill me. 
No, they said, we won't kill you, but we will tie you up securely and hand you over to them. So they tied him up with two new ropes and led them away from the rock. You think God's not working here? Just for a moment. Think about this. I mean, who of us, just put yourself in Samson sandals for a moment. Who of us would say, I'll go with you, just don't kill me. We'd be fighting to even go. I don't want to go. I don't trust you. You guys are all ticked off at me. I ain't going. I, I'm not going. <laughs> he goes, I'll go. Just promise you won't kill me. Think God's not at work here? Who of us would be that calm? Not me. I know I wouldn't be that calm. But you see something. Here's the third time that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him powerfully. The third time, verse 14. When he came to Lehi, the Philistines came to meet him, shouting, The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully on him. And the ropes that were on his arms and wrists became like burnt flax and fell off. He found a fresh jawbone of the donkey. I mean, here he is. He's led right in the center of all the Philistines. Right in the midst of them. And these little twigs, branch gone, picks up another jawbone of a donkey. It says, reached out his hand, took it, and killed a thousand men with it. Then Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, I have piled them in heaps. With the jawbone of a donkey, I have killed a thousand men. He's still upset just a little bit. He's got nowhere to turn, and he's just destroying the Philistines single-handedly. But isn't that what God said he was going to do through Samson? Not how I would do it. I mean, I'm still of the persuasion that tanks and F-14, 15, 16s are the way to go. Bombs! And God uses a jawbone of a donkey in the hand of a man. Look at verse 17. When he finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone and named the place Ramoth Lehi. He became very thirsty and called out to the Lord, You have accomplished this great victory through your servant. He gave credit where credit was due. It wasn't that he did it. It was God working through him. God's power working through Samson. Verse 19, So God split a hollow place in the ground at Lehi, and water came out of it. After Samson drank, his strength returned, and he revived. And that is why he named it en Hakore, which is still in Lehi today. And he judged Israel 20 years in the days of the Philistines. So for 20 years, there's a little bit of a, at least a somewhat time of peace. Philistines get the hint just a little bit, right? Here's this man that God's power is resting on. Here's this man that single-handedly takes out lions, groups of 30 men, groups of 1,000 men. Maybe we ought to just back off and leave this guy alone. To kind of get the hint, for the next 20 years, Samson rules. Then we come to chapter 16 and kind of the end of the story. Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute and went to bed with her. And when the Gazites heard that Samson was there, they surrounded the place and waited in ambush for him all that night at the city gate. They kept quiet all night saying, let's wait until dawn, then we will kill him. But Samson stayed in bed only until midnight. Then he got up, took hold of the doors of the city gate along with the two gateposts, pulled them out, bar and all. He put them on his shoulders and took them to the top of the mountain overlooking Hebron. Get a visual here. I, I, I don't know really what this looked like, but I know it was really big. Really, really big. Metal and all. Yanks them out of the ground. I mean, think, I mean, how much weight can one guy carry? I mean, just get a visual for a second here. In your mind's eye, get a visual of a guy carrying gates of the city on his back. Kind of what's going through the mind of the guys who are out waiting to ambush him. Yeah, guys, I think I'm going to let this one go. You guys got this one. <laughs> I'm not messing with the guy, right? Get a glimpse here. Verse 4. Sometime later, he fell in love with a woman named Delilah, who lived in Sorg Valley. The Philistine readers, leaders went to her and said, Persuade him to tell you where his great strength comes from, so we can overpower him, tie him up, and make him helpless. Each of us will then give you 
eleven pieces of eleven hundred pieces of silver. So Delilah, wanting the silver, why not? Sounds like a great idea. All these people, eleven hundred each. Sounds like a great idea. So Delilah said to Samson, Please tell me, where does your great strength come from? How could someone tie you up and make you helpless? Samson told her, If they tie me up with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dried, I will become weak and be like any other man. I think Samson had enough idea to know that this lady's not on board with all of it. I mean, a couple fries short of the Happy Meal. Yeah, I'm just going to tell you that. No problem. Here you go. Not. So the Philistine leaders brought her seven fresh bowstrings that had not been dried. She tied him up with them. And while the men in ambush were awaiting her room, she called out to him, Samson, the Philistines are here! But he snapped the bowstrings as a strand of yarn snaps when it is touched by fire. And the secret of his strength remained unknown. Can you imagine that just for a moment? Man, not getting that silver. Samson wasn't ready to give it up just yet. But you know he has a weakness. It's when they start to cry. Then Delilah said to Samson, You have mocked me and told me lies. Won't you please tell me how you can be tied up? He's heard all this before. And didn't get him ahead anywhere. He had to have learned. But God's working behind the scenes to do something to accomplish his, his, his will. Then Delilah said to Samson, You have mocked me, told me lies, won't you please tell me? Verse 11, he told her, If they tie me up with new ropes that have never been used, I will become weak and be like any other man. So Delilah took new ropes, tied him up with them, and shouted, Samson, the Philistines are here! But while the men in ambush were waiting in her room, he snapped the ropes off his arms like thread. And again, verse 13, Then Delilah said to Samson, You have mocked me all along and told me lies. Tell me how you can be tied up. And then he told her, If you weave the seven braids of my head into fabric on a loom. She fastened the braids with a pin and called to him, Samson, the Philistines are here. He awoke from his sleep and pulled out the pin with the loom in the web. I mean, think about this. Over and over, she, he's, just, he's just leading her along. And over and over, she's proven that she's not going to be faithful to him. Over and over, he just breaks out. In verse 15, here comes the pity me. How can you say I love you, she told him, when your heart is not with me? This is the third time you have mocked me and not told me what makes your strength so great. And if you're Samson, you're saying, this is the third time that you haven't been honest with me and you tried to kill me. But he didn't. So over and over, the Philistine leaders brought her seven bowstrings, all these things, he just nothing worked. Verse 16, but she nagged him day after day and pleaded with him until she wore him out. Here it is. She wore him out. To the point where he just said, I'm done, I'm done. I don't want to listen to this anymore. Because she nagged him day after day and pleaded with him until she wore him out, he told her the whole truth and said to her, My hair has never been cut because I'm a Nazarite to God from birth. If I am shaved, my strength will leave me, and I will become weak and be like any other man. And when Delilah realized that he had told her the whole truth, she sent this message to the Philistine leaders, Come one more time, for he has told me the whole truth. The Philistine leaders came to her and brought the silver with them. And they're confident, this time we're going to get him. Then she let him fall asleep on her lap and called a man to shave off the seven braids on his head. In this way she made him helpless, and his strength left him. Then she cried, Samson, the Philistines are here! And when he awoke from his sleep, he said, I will escape as I did before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Three times the Spirit of the Lord came on him powerfully. And this time, the Spirit of the Lord was gone. Verse 21, The Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, they brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles, and he was forced to grind grain in the prison. Look at verse 22. But his hair began to grow back after it had been shaved. And now the Philistine leaders gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to the god Dagon. And they rejoiced and said, Our God has handed over our enemy Samson to us. 
And when the people saw him, they praised their God and said, Our God has handed over to us our enemy who destroyed our land and who multiplied our dead. And when they were in good spirits, they said, Bring Samson here to entertain us. So they brought Samson from prison, and he entertained them and had him stand between the pillars. Probably the picture in our minds that we're most familiar with. I don't know exactly how this happened, but kind of get an idea from the story and how it's written that there's these pillars and and yet it doesn't say that he pulled them in and it broke. It says that he pushed them. So I'm not exactly how this all works out, but listen to this as we close the story. Verse 26 says, Samson said to the young man who was leading him by the hand, Lead me where I can feel the pillars supporting the temple so I can lean against them. And the temple was full of men and women and all the leaders of the Philistines were there and about 3,000 men and women were on the roof watching Samson entertain them. So not only was the temple full, 3,000 of them were on the roof of the temple. Everybody watching to see what Samson was going to do. He's just a spectacle. This man who had carried the gates of the city. This man who had torn apart a lion with his hands. This man who had killed 30 just for their garments. This man who had taken a jawbone of a donkey and killed a thousand. Now he's just a spectacle for everyone to watch. But remember, God is still in control. And God is still working through him to accomplish his own will. So, verse 28 He called out to the Lord, Lord God, please remember me. Strengthen me, God, just once more. With one act of vengeance, let me pay back the Philistines for my two eyes. Verse 29, Samson took hold of the two middle pillars supporting the temple. He leaned against them, one on right hand and one other on his left, and Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. He pushed with all his might, and the temple fell on the leader's and all the people in it, and those he killed at his death were more than those he had killed in his life. You see, God always has a plan. See, so it's kind of a crazy plan. I mean, it's not so, I mean, wouldn't it just been easier to do something else? Maybe. But see, a lot of people were involved in the plan. See, it all started with Manoah and his wife who couldn't have a child. They wanted a child, but they couldn't have one. And God says, I'm going to bless you with a child, but not just an ordinary child. I'm going to bless you with a judge named Samson. And Samson is going to take care of the Philistines for me. God always has a lot of people, and it causes Manoah and his wife to begin to worship the Lord and to sacrifice to the Lord. It caused Samson to realize that it's not about me. In the end, he said, Lord, just one more time, give me the strength. So I may take vengeance on these people. In doing so, he might have been doing it selfishly. But in doing so, he was accomplishing God's will, wasn't he? Destroying the Philistines and taking care of them. All these people that were on the roof of 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 the temple and all those that were inside of it, in just a moment of time, pushing this. Can you imagine just being, once again, just imagine for a moment. You're one of the people in the stands, so to speak. You're a spectator watching Samson lean against the pillars. What would be going through your mind? There is no way in heaven this guy is going to knock out a pillar. Are you kidding me? Not going to happen. After all, he's, he's ordinary now. He doesn't have the strength that he once had. This, this guy's crazy. But in the next thought, they're all being crushed. He said, let me die. And he pushed with all his might. And the temple fell on the leaders and all the people in it. And those he killed at his death were more than those he killed. In verse 31, then his brothers and all his father's family came down, carried him back, buried him between Zorah and Eshtel on the tomb of his father Manoah. So he judged Israel 20 years. God displayed his power through Samson. I have to wonder, as I was thinking about, how, how does this apply to you and me? So it's just a neat story. So it's just a story that highlights God's ability to work through man. So it highlights a really strong man, so to speak. But how, how does it apply to you and I? 
several things came to my mind. Number one, God is always at work. He's always at work. I don't know what's happening in some of your lives, but I am confident in the fact that God always has a plan. He knows what he's doing. He makes no mistakes, right? He knows what he's doing. You could say, man, what a waste. The guy, he probably wasn't that old. I mean, maybe he was only 35, 40 years old at the most. I don't, I don't know. He, he rode for 20 years, and he didn't start till he was a grown man, so maybe he's 40 years old. I, I don't know. Seems like it's awful young to die. Unless God has a plan. God always has a plan. And secondly, I don't have to know it. I want to know it. But the reality is, if I did know it, it might scare me. Go, oh God, tell me where I'm going to be in 15 years. Be cool to know, unless, <laughs> unless there's an accident lined up that I don't know about that may just for me out. Then it's not so cool. I don't have to know the plan. But what I do have to do is be obedient. Take each day and trust God with it. Each day. Not next week, not three weeks from now, but today. Trust God today. Knowing that He's in control. Number three. It's not about me. We say that all the time, but do we really believe that? It's not about me. It's about what God's doing through me. Because if we're walking in obedience to God, anything that God does choose to do through us brings the glory back to Him. In the end, God accomplished His goal. Not how you would do it, not how I would do it. But God accomplished His goal. The Israelites were living in wickedness and sinfulness. And God says, these choices have consequences. You're going to be under the hand of the Philistines. But just know, I'll take care of that too later. So in the midst of all the struggles, God has us to learn some lessons. So the next thing is, what lessons is God trying to teach you? What lessons are God trying to teach you through the struggles that you're facing? I think it's good to ask God that once in a while. God, what is it that you want me to learn through these difficulties? I don't know about you. There are certain people in the church every once in a while that remind me that God works through the problems that bring patience. I don't want any more patience. God knows I need too much of it. Because in asking for patience, we're going we're gonna to have to go through some more struggles. And I don't want that. have got enough for a while. But on the flip side of that, it's good to ask God, what is it that you're trying to teach me through this? So, where are you at in the story? Aware that God's working in the background? That he has a plan? Willing to do what he asks you to do, even though you may not understand it? Knowing that he has a plan and you don't have to know all the details? Understand that you're going through some struggles, but needing... To just say, God, what do you want me to learn through them? But in the big picture, God is going to accomplish his will. And he's going to be glorified through it. In the end, Samson killed more of the Philistines in that one single action than he had done in his lifetime. Didn't do it how we do it. But that's okay, he's God. And God will display his power through man. If we let him. What's God wanting to do in and through your life? Will you let him work? Will you be obedient? Will you learn what he wants you to learn? Will you trust him with your life? Let's pray.